In the early 11th century, a remarkable discovery unfolded in the ancient city of Hamadan, nestled in what is now Western Iran. There, scholars and physicians stumbled upon a treasure, but not the kind one might expect. No gold, no jewels, no worldly riches. Instead, they found an abundant fortune of thoughts, philosophy, and medicinal cures. Among these intellectual gems was a particularly striking concept, the floating man, a profound exploration of human consciousness that continues to intrigue us centuries later. Imagine a man awakening in midair, with no sensory contact with the world, suspended in space. No sight, no touch, no sound. Would he still know he exists? This man, floating in the void, devoid of all physical connections, would still be able to affirm his own existence through his consciousness alone. This is the essence of the floating man thought experiment conceived by one of history's most brilliant minds, Ibn Sina, known in the West as Avicenna. This experiment was Avicenna's way of demonstrating that our sense of self does not depend on our external senses or physical environment. Instead, it arises from our ability to think and reflect. Now you must be wondering who Ibn Sina was and how his journey began. Avicenna was born in 980 in Afshana, a village near the major city of Bukhara, now part of modern Uzbekistan. His father, originally from Balkh, moved north, seeking better job opportunities and became a government official for the Persian Samanid dynasty, which controlled the region. The family moved to Bukhara when Avicenna was young. This was the place where he grew up, received his education, and started his career in philosophy among the educated elite, closely connected to the Samanid rulers. Growing up in a Persian Muslim family that valued learning, Avicenna was exposed to a rigorous educational regime from an early age. His exceptional memory and intellectual capabilities allowed him to memorize the Quran by the age of 10. In 996 AD, the Samanid ruler Nuh ibn Mansur was suffering from a severe illness that his physicians could not cure. Avicenna was given the chance to treat the ruler due to his growing reputation as a young, but highly knowledgeable and skilled physician. Avicenna successfully diagnosed and treated the ruler at the mere age of 16. Impressed with his abilities, the ruler granted Avicenna access to the royal library of the Samanids. This library was well stocked with a vast array of texts, including many rare works and translations, which played a crucial role in furthering Avicenna's education and significantly influenced his future works in medicine, philosophy, and the sciences. Shortly after gaining access to the Royal Library, Avicenna wrote his first book, Compendium on the Soul, which he dedicated to the ruler as a thank you. This book gave him a lot of fame, due to which by the age of 21, a neighbor named Arudi asked him to write a detailed book covering all aspects of philosophy except for mathematics. Avicenna completed this task with a work called Philosophy for Arudi. Knowing this, another neighbor, Baraki, requested commentaries on all major philosophical works, primarily those by Aristotle. Avicenna responded by writing a 20-volume series titled The Available and the Valid and a two-volume series on ethics called Piety and Sin. After his father passed away, Avicenna took a job in the financial administration of the Samanid rulers, a role he found without difficulty given his growing fame and capabilities. But this is when his life took a dramatic turn. In 999, the Turkic Karakanids conquered Bukhara, ending the Samanid rule. Due to his close ties with the Samanids and his high-ranking position, Avicenna felt it necessary to flee Bukhara. He did not elaborate on the reasons in his autobiography, simply stating that necessity led me to forsake Bukhara. This marked the start of his life as a traveling scholar, constantly seeking new patrons and employment opportunities. He first moved to Gurganj in Khwarizm, then to Jurjan near the Caspian Sea, and eventually to the heart of Iran, 
stopping in Ray and Hamad Han before ending up in Isfahan. Here, he started his remarkable writing career at age 21. He wrote on many subjects, including mathematics, geometry, astronomy, physics, metaphysics, language, music, and poetry, producing around 240 works that still exist today. His work was often disrupted by the political and religious conflicts of the time, which forced him to keep moving. However, he found a period of stability and security in Isfahan under the patronage of Ala al-Dawla. It was during this time that Avicenna experienced his most productive years. Every Friday, he led discussions with other scholars on various topics. In this peaceful environment, he completed significant works such as Kitab al-Shifa, the Book of Healing, Danish Nama i Allahi, the Book of Knowledge, and Kitab al-Najat, the Book of Salvation. And he also created new and more accurate astronomical tables. Avicenna's main work, Kitab al-Shifa, is a four-part encyclopedia covering logic, physics, mathematics, and metaphysics. This work shows his attempt to classify all knowledge broadly, for instance, in the physics section, he discusses various sciences such as general principles, celestial and terrestrial bodies, primary elements, meteorology, mineralogy, botany, zoology, and psychology. He also considers other sciences like medicine, astrology, physiognomy, dream interpretation, magical talismans, and theurgy as important, though he ultimately dismissed alchemy. While working with Ala al-Dawla, Avicenna became ill with colic. To treat himself, he used a drastic method of eight celery seed enemas in one day. Unfortunately, an attendant mistakenly or deliberately changed the mixture, using too much of the active ingredient, which caused damage to his intestines. To make matters worse, when Avicenna tried to treat the pain with a mild opium-based medicine called Mithridate, a slave tried to poison him by adding too much opium to the remedy. Despite these setbacks, Avicenna continued to travel with Ala al-Dawla to Hamadan. His condition worsened during the journey, and on the 22nd of June, in the year 1037 CE, he eventually passed away during the holy month of Ramadan. While the exact time of his death is not commonly recorded, it is known that he died at the age of 56 or 57. Avicenna's legacy continues to be significant. His tomb in Hamadan, which had fallen into disrepair, was refurbished in the 1950s with a new tower, museum, and library, making it a popular tourist and pilgrimage site. Avicenna remains a respected figure in both the scholarly world and among the general public. Imagine a book so thorough so precise that it was the ultimate guide for doctors both in the East and the West. Yes, his works, such as the Book of Healing, not about medicine alone, but about everything from the stars in the sky to the earth under our feet. His book, The Canon of Medicine, became a key resource in Europe's top medical schools until the early modern period. This book is organized into five sections, dealing with everything from basic elements and anatomy to different types of diseases and detailed treatments using drugs. Although Al-Razi was highly regarded for his medical contributions, Avicenna was often preferred by many doctors for his clear organization. Avicenna was not just about theory, he also put great emphasis on practical, evidence-based medicine, a concept that seems modern but has historical roots. He believed in using experience to find effective remedies, a practice that influenced many later medical scholars like Arnold de Villanova and Bernard de Gordon. Avicenna's approach helped frame medicine as a science that relies on careful observation and evidence, setting the stage for today's medical practices. It's tough to fully know Avicenna's personal life because most information about him comes from the autobiography his protégé Al-Jujani wrote. Avicenna enjoyed life with a love for music, drinks, and was known for his sharp wit 
and intelligence, which won him many friends, but also enemies, because he didn't always follow strict social norms. He was seen as arrogant at times, especially in his criticisms of previous scholars like Al-Razi. Avicenna also seemed to be a lonely person who was very careful about his survival in a politically unstable environment. Avicenna's work greatly influenced medieval European thought, blending Neoplatonic and Aristotelian ideas into accessible texts that organized all known human knowledge of his time. This made him a pivotal figure in transferring ancient Greek knowledge to Europe, especially through his medical texts, which were used in European schools until the 17th century. But the question still stands, why is Ibn Sina still relevant? His works formed the backbone of medical education in Europe and the Islamic world for centuries. His thoughts on the nature of the soul, existence and ethics continue to inspire debates in philosophy, medicine and the sciences. So, what can we take from the life of this remarkable man? Perhaps it's that the greatest adventures lie within the pages of a book. This is Rapid Rewind signing off. Remember, legends never fade, they just get retold. Stay tuned for the next one.